So in our last class, we began with the question that each lecturer will teach. What we covered in our last class was the background to the course. But it must be restated that the background to the course lies in the English Reformation. Most of the issues we will treat will come across on the course have the background in the English Reformation. During the Renaissance and during the reign of King Henry VIII, who wanted the Pope to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon so that he could remarry in pursuit or with the aim of having a male heir. Now, when the church of Rome or the Catholic Church refused to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Henry VIII broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and established the Anglican Church or the Church of England, over which he was the head and could decide what he wanted to do with his life, because he's now the head of the church. And so with that, with the breaking away from the church, Henry was able to marry as many wives as he wanted, and to have a male heir in the process. So the breaking away of the English church from the Catholic church signals the English Reformation and all the conflicts that will arise between the Protestants and the Catholics in the course of time, leading to the English Civil War and the beheading of Charles I. You would recall that the, the Reformation movement, the Protestant movement, had a just cause with Luther. When he nailed his 95 thesis on the church door in Wittenberg. But for Henry VIII, his reformation cause was um, for more selfish reasons, which was to establish his dynasty. So that's what we tried to establish in our last class. Specifically, as far as this course is concerned, we are going to pay attention to the neoclassical period, beginning with the, restor with the restoration. And so when you see the Protestants and the Catholic um, supporters clashing, your mind must flash back to the Reformation. 
And I was surprised recently to learn that they even carried that war to African soil during the colonial era and even till today because somebody said that he could not be made a prefect in a Catholic school because he was a protestant in Nigeria, in Nigerian school. And I was like, so this, in, this war in England was brought to Africa and is still being fought. The, the, the relation between politics and religion is not only played out at the uh, macro level of power, but even in things like class perfect. So you could imagine the far-reaching effects or consequences of ideologies, which is why I always tell my students, whenever religion is mentioned, you must be careful of how you respond or react. Because in that very moment, depending on what you say, your, your destiny could be altered forever and forever. Okay? Because somebody just listens to you making a remark about a certain religion, and then the person marks you and politically blocks you stage by stage. So is that serious? And so when you hear that somebody has been burned somewhere, it's not only in that religion. Some other um, religion, including the ones that emphasize grace, could also be dangerous. Just that they might not burn you, but they might metaphorically burn you when you go against that beliefs. So the war is still on, and you might want to be very careful. So with the restoration came the monarchy of Charles, the restoration of Charles II's monarchy to England in 1660. So um, I would just want to run down, run down on the, give a rundown, just want to give a rundown on the the monarchs whose time periods or ages will be considering as far as this course is concerned. Beginning with the restoration, we have Charles II. Beginning with the restoration, we have Charles II. Who ruled from 1660? Who ruled from 1660 to 1685? Who ruled from 1660 to 1685? About 25 years. About 25 years. 1660 to 1685. 25 years. After Charles II, you have James, his brother, his Catholic brother, James II. James ruled from 1685 to 1688. Just three years. We'll tell you why. Probably lacked common sense. James the second ruled from 1685 to 1688. Just three years. And then he abdicated. He ran away helter skelter. And after that, we have William of Orange and Mary. William of Orange. William of Orange. It is the orange that you know. 
the orange that you love and enjoy. It is that same orange. Okay? And Mary, William of Orange and his wife Mary ruled from 1689 to 1702. 1689 to 1702. About 13 years. About 13 years. After them came Queen Anne. Queen Anne ruled and is a double N E, Queen Anne, ruled from 1702 to 1714. Twelve years. Queen Anne ruled from 1702 to 1714. About 12 years. After Queen Anne, you have Judge the First. Judge the First. Judge the first. He ruled from 1714 to 1727. 1714 to 1727. This is the period that we that our, our discussion will be covering. After Judge the first, you have Judge the second. After Judge the first. You have Judge the Second. And Judge the Second ruled from 1727 to 1760. 1727. Judge the Second ruled from 1727 to 1760. 33 years. 33 years. 33 years. After Judge the Second, you have Judge the Third. After Judge the Second, you have Judge the Third. Judge the Third ruled from 1760 to 1820. Judge the Third ruled from 1760 to 1820. 60 years. 60 years. After Judge the Third, you have Judge the Fourth. After Judge the Third, you have Judge the Fourth. Judge the Fourth. He ruled from 1820 to 1830. Rule from 1820 to 1830. That was 10 years. After him came William the Fourth. William the Fourth. William the Fourth. William the Fourth ruled from 1830. To 1837, which effectively marks the beginning of the Victorian period. Uh, so William the Fourth ruled from 1830 to 1837, seven years. Ruled for seven years. Ruled for seven years. And after him came Queen Victoria. After him came Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria reigned from 1837 to 1901. Queen Victoria reigned from 1837 the 1901. She ruled for 64 years, approximately. She ruled for 64 years. She had the longest reign 
in that era. And so when she died, the Victorian period came to an end. It's assumed that the modern period is about to begin. The next monarch is Edward the Seven. Edward the Seven. When we talked about the Edwardian era the other time. Remember that most of the eras were mentioned were named after their monarchs. Most of the eras were named after the monarchs. So we have Edward the Seventh ruled from 1901 to 1910. 1901 to 1910. Edward the Seventh ruled from 1901 to 1910, about nine years. Then after him came King George. King George the Fifth. King George the Fifth. King George the Fifth. King George the Fifth ruled from 1910 to 1936 into the heart of the modern period. So we've gone a bit beyond our scope to let you know um, the monarchs and the period that our literature will cover, but this course is ending with the Victorian period. Okay? That's what you need to know. And we go back to the Restoration period. And we are going to look at Restoration literature, after talking about some of the important political and religious events. So Charles II is associated with the Restoration period. Charles II is associated with the Restoration period. because the restoration period is marked by the restoration of monarchy to the English political system. After the long years of the Civil War, and as we said in the last class, with this restoration of monarchy, we also had other forms of restoration like the restoration of literature, the reopening of the theaters, the long peace, the flourishing of literature. So Charles had a long reign, as we saw in the fact that he reigned for 25 years. Though he had a stable reign, there are two important events that shook his era and threatened the peace, at least early on in his reign. And it's important that you know about these two events. You can even read more about them. We are talking about the Great Plague of London. I'm talking about the Great Plague of London. Plague, P-L-A. G U E. That would be plague. If you spell it with Q U E, that would be something else. 
So the Great Plague of London. It started in 1665. 1665 and ended in 1666. 1666. Well, you can note the 666. Because it must have also had some spiritual significance to the people of the time. Okay? They must have thought that the world was coming to an end. This plague killed not less than 75,000 people. This plague killed not less than 75,000 people. And then after the Great Plague of London came the Great Fire of London. The plague and then the fire. There was a plague and then there was the fire. Okay? After the Great Plague of London, you had the Great Fire of London. Fire. <laughs> the Great Fire of London. It happens in 1666, so you must understand um, the significance of the numbers. Okay? 1666. It began on the 2nd of September and lasted till the 6th of September, during which the entire city was raised to the ground in which a large part of the city was raised to the ground. So significantly, significantly, after the plague came the fire, and you might say that the fire was meant to purge the plague. All right? To burn and perish the plague, and cleanse the land. So it was more or less a kind of spiritual cleansing of the land from plague, or of plague. So after these two tragedies, Charles was able to lead the city, the nation, to its success story, not only in political relations, but also in other achievements that we talked about in the last class, like the flourishing of the teacher, the chattering of the royal society. and the continuous expansion of the English economic and financial system through exploration and exploitation in distant lands. Charles was a king who had common sense. Charles was a king who had common sense. He was a diplomat. He was a diplomat to the core. He knew that he was ruling a deeply divided society. He knew that he was ruling a deeply divided society, society polarized by politics and religion. He knew that he was ruling a deeply polarized society, society that was divided along religious and political lines. 
Because on the one hand, you had the Catholics and the protest, and then on the other hand, you had the Protestants. On the one hand, you had the supporters of the king, and the other hand, you had the supporters of parliament. Okay? So, the, the, the parliamentarians were mostly known as the Whigs. The parliamentarians were mostly known as the Whigs. Whigs. Okay? I hope you must have spelled something, but the Whig is spelled W H I. G S W H G S on the one hand the supporters of the weak the parliamentarians members of parliament were known as the weak the weak and then the supporters of the, the the monarchy supporters of the crown were known as the Tories known as the Tories, known as the Tories, T-O-R-I-E-S, the Tories. So English politics to this day could still be discussed in these terms, in varying ways, in varying degrees. We also have, still have the Whigs and the Tories dominating English politics. So Charles II ruled in such a way that he was able to maintain peace between the two factions, which is what a leader is supposed to do. A leader is supposed to be someone who unites and not one who divides or polarizes. And he did this by knowing when to compromise and knowing when to put his foot down. He did this by knowing when to compromise and knowing when to put his foot down. Charles II was able to satisfy all the parties because he knew when to compromise and he knew when to stand and he knew when to stand his ground. And he knew when to stand his ground. On matters of state. On matters of state. So this is how he was able to maintain peace between the Catholics and the Protestants, between the Tories and the Whigs throughout his reign. He was a diplomat. Okay? For instance, let me give you an instance. Charles II was a Catholic at heart. Right? He was a Catholic at heart. But he was openly a Protestant because the Protestants were the majority. Please take note of this. Charles II was a Catholic at heart. He knew within himself that he was Catholic, but he presented himself to the people more as a Protestant so that he would be accepted because the Protestants were in the majority. And of course, throughout his reign, it could have been possible that the Catholics were plotting on how to return to power. He gave in to, he gave in to 
the request by the Protestants to reform the Anglican Church. Because what you need to note about the major problem of the Puritan was that the Anglican Church was not reformed enough. The major problem that the Puritans had okay, was that the Anglican Church, the, the Church of England, was not reformed enough. They quarreled with the fact that or with the idea that they, 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 they were dissatisfied because they believed that the Church of England still retained most of its Catholic character. So they wanted the changes to be so marked that you could clearly see the difference between the Catholic and the Protestant Church. And this thing still continues till today. Where people leave the substance of the religion and bring in other things just to create differences. All right? When I give you some of the texts that I want to assign to you to use, to see how ridiculous it is, just to show that they are different from that particular sect. And today you see that if you go to certain places, you don't put, you don't wear your headgear in a certain way, they might not allow you to um, enter the church because you've not worn it properly. That's not how we wear it, okay? In our church, okay, in our church, you have to wear it in such a way that it will cover here and here, so don't allow any hair to come out. That's how we do it here. Okay, is God concerned about all those things? That's what we are talking about. So that was the problem of the Puritans. The Puritans, the Puritans thought that the English church was not reformed, was not purged of its Catholic influences. And so part of Charles' A diplomatic gesture was to allow such reformation. Right? It was to allow such changes. Because as a common, uh, as, as, as a king with common sense, he knew that that did not have much to do with God. It was just a matter of religious practices. Okay? So, and this was how Charles was able to establish his reign and ensure peace for as long as he reigned. But Charles had a problem. Charles had a problem. Everybody say, What was the problem? What was the problem? So Charles had a wife by name Catherine of Braganza. Charles had a wife by name Catherine of Braganza. B R A G A N Z A Braganza. Okay, it's a nice name. One of you can pick it. Pick it up. Braganza. B R A G A N Z A. Catherine of Braganza. Okay. B R A G A N Z A. Catherine of Braganza. She could not produce a male A. She could not produce a male A.
owing to the fact that Charles hardly went in to his wife uh, because he spent most of the time he had with his mistresses. Because there are several of them. Charles did not spend much time with Catherine. He spent most of his time with his mistresses. With several mistresses. With whom he fathered many illegitimate children. Many illegitimate male children. With whom Charles II fathered many illegitimate male children. Remember, we had said in our last class that Charles II was a fun-loving king, right? He was a fun-loving king. Today we can say he was a slave king, right? <laughs> so that Charles II was a slave king. But he spent, he spent most of the time in the theaters enjoying his plays and spend the other time with his mistresses and abandoned his wife, neglected his wife and his duties to the wife. And the results were there for everyone to see because Charles fathered many illegitimate children from his mistresses but did not have any with his lawful... <laughs> All right. And as time went on, and the king aged, you know, the passage of time brings age on the individual, adds age to the individual. As time went on, and the king aged, as time went on, and the king aged, there were concerns. There were concerns among the English populace Usually the Protestants. They were concerned among the English populace, especially the Protestants, that the king would die without the possibilities of James, uh, you open the possibility of Charles' Catholic brother, James. coming to the throne. Which will open up the possibility of Charles Catholic brother James coming to the throne. Remember in the last slide I said that whenever the monarch was a Catholic, the Catholics will rejoice. All right? They will be happy because they know that the, they are the ones ruling. And the Protestants will suffer. And whenever a Protestant monarch was on the throne, the Protestant would be happy. Because they are the ones ruling, and the Catholics will be oppressed. So it was important, it was important who ruled. It was of utmost importance, the, the religious orientation of the king or the queen, was very important. Okay? Just as it is in your country today. In, in some people's country, even if the candidate is, does not have any certificate, only has Nepal bill, because of his religion, his people, that people will vote. So they don't care. Right? So it did not start today. So there were concerns that Charles would die without an A and James will come to the throne. And there was a problem with James. James was, James was not as emotionally intelligent 
was not as, as diplomatic as Charles. James was not as emotionally intelligent, was not as diplomatic as Charles. Okay? So it's important to pursue, to pursue um, cognitive intelligence. But it's also very important to also pursue emotional intelligence. And to cultivate the art or the art, the skill of diplomacy. Because you'll be dealing with human beings, and human beings are tricky lots. And as a leader, if you are not, if you do not cultivate the skill in dealing with human beings, you definitely not last long on the throne. So Charles was openly, um, James was openly Catholic. And he made everybody aware of his political stand, religious stand. He was not like his brother, Charles II. So he was a flag flying Catholic. Okay? Bragged about his faith, even say what he would do when he would become king. Okay? And the people feared what would happen when he came to the throne if Charles died without an A. All right, so you pay attention because we are now in the middle of the restoration politics. Because when, when I ask you about the restoration politics, you must remember that the restor restoration politics is a politics of succession. Politics of what? Succession. Who will come to the throne after me? Who will rule after me? That's the restoration politics. Politics of succession. So the the parliaments, the parliament led by Anthony Hashley Cooper. The parliament led by Anthony Ashley Cooper. Anthony Ashley Cooper. Did I spell Anthony? Ashley is spelled A S H L E Y. A S H L E Y. Ashley. Anthony Ashley Cooper. Cooper is spelled C double O. P E R. He lived between sixteen twenty one and sixteen eighty three. He lived between sixteen twenty one and sixteen eighty three. Was the Earl of Shaftesbury? The Earl of Shaftesbury was the Earl of Shaftesbury. Earl is spelled E-A-R-L. Then Shaftesbury is S-H-A-F-T-E-S-B-U-R-Y. Shaftesbury. The Earl of Shaftesbury. I'm going to take that again. S-H-A-F-T-E. S B U R Y, the Earl of Shaftesbury, Anthony Ashley Cooper, the head of parliament. Okay? One of the weeks, he was a week. He was what? A week. He was a week. The leader of the week. W H I G. Okay? 
wanted to um, impress upon Charles II to legitimize one of his illegitimate sons so that when he dies, the son will rule after him. Shaftesbury sponsored a bill in Parliament. Shaftesbury sponsored a bill in Parliament to force Charles II to legitimize one of his illegitimate children, one of his illegitimate sons. So that after Charles had died, this person will rule after him. The name of the person was James Scott. James Scott. Scott is spelled S C O double T. S C O double T. James Scott. He was the Duke of Monmouth. 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 James Court, the Duke, the Duke of Monmouth. Monmouth is spelled M O N M O U T H. Monmouth, the Duke of Monmouth. So, inwardly, inwardly, Charles had decided to reserve the throne for his Catholic brother. So he knew that he could not ascend to the request of Parliament. Inwardly, Charles had reserved the throne for his Catholic brother. Remember, Charles was a Catholic at heart. And when he was dying, he received the last rites of the Catholic Church. That shows you what he really believed in. On his dead bed, on his dying bed, uh, bed he received the last sacrament of the Catholic Church. Because that was where his heart was. Okay, so the people of England were apprehensive when James had a son and there was a possibility for an endless Catholic monarch in England. People of England were apprehensive. You know what it means for somebody to, someone to be apprehensive? I'm going to talk about when it is a national apprehension. There was the people of England were apprehensive when James had a son. And that opened up the possibilities of an endless Catholic monarch coming to the throne of England. People were afraid that forever and forever they will be ruled by a Catholic. And so they had to do something about it. So they put pressure on Charles to legitimize James Cook to become man. And, of course, Duke, uh, James Scott was a, a, an open Protestant, was openly Protestant, just like um, James was openly Catholic. And they were able to turn the young man against the father. They were able to turn the young man against the father.
So matters were aggravated. Matters were aggravated during the Popish plot crisis. During the Popish plot crisis of 1678. Matters were aggravated during the Popish plot crisis of 1678. Popish plot, Popish is spelled P O P I S H from Pope. This Popish plot crisis led 1678. This Popish plot crisis led to the past struggle between the Whigs and the Tories. What really happened? What really happened? There was a man of questionable character by name Titus Oates. There was a man of, um, a man of questionable character by name Titus Oates. Titus Oates. Spelled Oates spelled O A O A T E S L A T E S. Titus. He brought an allegation that there was a Jesuit plot to assassinate the king. It was a Jesuit plot. Jesuit, you must have come across this term before. Capital J E S U I T. Jesuit plot. A sect of Catholic, Catholic priests. There was a, a Jesuit plot to assassinate the king, burn London, and massacre protestants. Such allegations are, uh, are not usually taken lightly. That the Catholics were plotting to do what? Assassinate the king, burn down London, and massacre the protestants. Massacre the protestants. And that the intention was to re-establish the Roman Catholic Church in England. That the intention was to re-establish the Roman Catholic Church in England. And that the intention was to re-establish the Roman Catholic Church in England. Now, everybody knew that Titus of Oates, that Titus Oates was someone who could not be relied upon because of his character, whose words could not be relied upon because of his character. Everybody knew that Titus of Oates was someone who you could not rely upon because of his character. So, <clears throat> excuse me, he could easily have been ignored except that something terrible happened. It could easily have been ignored, except that something terrible happened. Except that something terrible happened. Look, I've just said, okay, leave Titus of old. We know him. We cannot depend on his words. So Sir Edmund Berry got Frey. Sir Edmund Berry got Frey. Sir Edmund Barry Godfrey, Edmund E D M U N D Barry B E W R Y Godfrey G O D F R E Y who was a prominent London Justice of the Peace. who was a prominent London justice of the peace, was murdered just days, just days before receiving Titus Oates' testimony 
for safekeeping. He was murdered just days before receiving Titus Oates' testimony for safekeeping. He was murdered just days before receiving Titus Oates' testimony for safekeeping. Okay. Papers were found in the Duke of York Secretary's office. The Duke of York was uh, James. Was James. Charles um, Catholic brother. Papers were found in the Duke of York Secretary's office. And these papers reveal that the Duke had been in correspondence. And the Duke had been in correspondence with the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth regarding the reestablishment of the Roman Catholic Church in England. Papers were found in the Duke of York Secretary's office. And these papers reveal that the Duke of York had been in correspondence with the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth regarding the re-establishment of the Roman Catholic Church in England. Papers were found in the Duke of York's office Duke of York's secretary's office. Duke of York's secretary's office. And these papers revealed that, that the Duke had been in correspondence with the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth, Louis Spell L O U I S, regarding the re establishment of the Catholic Church in England. There is, the outcome of this revelation was a mob action, a mob action directed against Catholics. It was a mob action directed against the Catholics. And several people were killed. And it also led to, also led to more pressure mounting on Charles II to legitimize James Scott. But when the parliament Made to pass this bill, to pass this, to pass a bill excluding James from the throne. To pass a bill excluding James from the throne. When the parliament made to pass a bill to exclude James from ever becoming king. Charles II dissolved Parliament. Charles II dissolved Parliament. And did not allow Parliament to meet again until the end of his reign. Of his reign. Did not allow Parliament to meet again until the end of his reign. Shaftesbury is charged with treason and sent to prison. Shaftesbury is charged with treason and sent to prison. 
after he helped to parade James Scott around the streets of London as the heir apparent. Charles II dissolved Parliament in, in 1681. Charles II dissolved Parliament in, 18, in 1681, sorry. 1681. Because the Parliament is full of wicks, Charles Berry could not be convicted, but he was emotionally and spiritually broken by the accusation. I did not live long afterwards. He died like two years afterwards. So at the end of, of the, when Charles died, um, James came to the throne because he had already decided that the throne would go to his brother. So this is what we normally refer to as the restoration politics, which is captured in John Dryden's Absalom and Agitophel. This is what is usually referred to as restoration politics, the restoration politics captured in John Dryden's Absalom and Agitophel. which is a mock epic that satirizes the events that led to the restoration crisis. It's a mock epic that satirizes, satirizes the events that led to the, to the restoration crisis. Now, John Dryden, it should be noted, was a prominent restoration writer. John Dryden, it should be noted, was a prominent restoration writer. He lived between 1631 and 1700. So he, he outlived Charles II himself. He lived between 1631 and 1700. He was a poet and playwright. He was a poet and playwright. He was made poet laureate in 1668. He was made poet laureate in 1668. Poet laureate. Laureate is spelled L A U R E A T E and not whatever you have spelled. L A U R E a T E, Pet Laureate, was made Pet Laureate in 1668. The, the poem, the Mockeric poem, Absalom and Akitophel, was written in 1681. At the peak of the Restoration Crisis. And in it, 
In it, Bryden tries to tries to drum up some support for the crown while also chiding the excesses of the king. Especially the part that the part that involves his neglect of his lawful wife which led to his not having legitimate male aides. Dryden, um, Dryden, it should be noted, made his art to be in the service of the nation. So he was a national poet. Dryden, it should be noted, made his art to be in the service of the nation. So you could be called a national poet. Gardner attended the Westminster School. Gardner attended the Westminster School. The Westminster School. The Westminster School. Gardner attended the Westminster School. He also attended the Trinity, also attended the Trinity College, also attended the Trinity College, Cambridge, and had his degree in 1654. Attended the Trinity College, Cambridge, and had his degree in 1654. His first poem was entitled Heroic Stanzas. His first poem was entitled Heroic Stanzas. His first poem was entitled Heroic Stanzas. Please don't give up. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Help is on the way. Okay. It was published in 1659. Eric Stanzas was published in 1659. This poem was written in commemoration of Cromwell's death. So you could also see that, you could see how his poems from the beginning had national overtone, was in the service of the nation, right? I hope you remember who Cromwell was, right? The great Puritan, okay? He also wrote a poem to celebrate the return of Charles II. He also wrote a poem to celebrate the return of Charles II. Again, the poem is up there examining the politics, the national issues, of the country. I also wrote a poem to celebrate the return of Charles II. This poem is called Astra Redux. A S T R A E A. Astra Redux. R E D U X. He also wrote. He also wrote, in 1668, Essay of the Dramatic Poesy. Essay of the Dramatic Poesy. Essay of the Dramatic Poesy. Which based his thoughts on literary criticism of the age. Which bears his thoughts on the literary criticism of the age. Essay of the Dramatic Poesy in 1668. In 1670, Darwin was made historiographer royal. Darwin was made historiographer royal. Royal. 
Royal, Royal, R O Y A L, Royal, historiographer, Royal. 1670. So he was a decorated writer, recognized by the nation, honored by the nation, which he used his art to serve. Was a decorated writer. Celebrated by the nation, recognized by the nation, which he uses or which he used his art to serve. He wrote Maflegno in 1682. Maflegno is one of the poems we're going to study on the course. So after we study Absalom and Kitofer, we'll study Maflegno. Maflegno is spelled, if you had the color line. This poem should, shouldn't really be um, strangers to you, but probably because you don't have the cause outline. That's why they're strange, or they're stranger than strange. Okay? okay? So, Maflegno, you have capital M C. Then you have Flegno, still has one word F L E C K N O E. Maflegno. Maflegno. MC. Okay? Essentially, we still have MC following people's name today. Right? MC what? <laughs> Maflegno. MC F L E C K N O E. Right? Maflegno. Means the son of Phlegno, right? The son of Phlegno. Math means son of, right? Math Phlegno, 1682. Then he wrote Absalom and Achitophel in 1681. He wrote Math Phlegno in 1682, wrote Absalom and Achitophel in 1681. When Charles II passed on in 1685 and James II came to the throne, when Charles II passed on in 1685 and James II came to the throne, Dryden converted to Catholicism probably for political expedience, or probably really believes in Catholicism, all right? Or maybe he was trying to survive politically, right? Maybe he was trying to survive politically. Because it was so bad, if a Catholic king was ruling and you were Protestant, you'd be stripped of your offices. You'd not be allowed to hold any public office. So that's why I, when I said that these people suffered, I really meant it. There was a lot of de deprivation out there. You were, in fact, you were just you were as insignificant as a rat. You couldn't access certain public institutions by virtue of the fact that you didn't identify with the religion of the monarch. Right? So probably I think that Dryden converted to Catholicism because James was a Catholic, all right, and he hoped to continue to survive politically. Or he really believed in Catholicism. So, or it could be both, right? So, don't blame some of your politicians when they convert from one ship to another for survival. That's happened before. Okay. And then something happened. Remember that James ruled for just three years, all right? James ruled for only three years. And after that, William and Mary came to the throne. So when William and Mary came to the throne, Reverend could not convert back <laughs> to Protestantism, all right? And so he lost all his offices, okay? When 
William and Mary came to the throne, Darwin could not convert again to Protestantism because these guys are Protestant. So he lost all his offices. We'll talk about this more when we'll be looking at Mark Flegner. Now, the poem, Absalom and Achitophel, is written against the background of the restoration politics. The poem Absalom and Achitophel is written, or was written, against the background of the restoration politics. In writing this poem, writing this poem, Dryden draws an important biblical analogy. Writing this poem, Dryden draws an important biblical analogy, which was quite striking, all right? Because of how the Bible events correlated with the events in Dryden's time, which informs the title, the title signal that event, the title signals that event, the title signals that event. And what's the title of the poem? Absalom and Achitophel. Okay. Now, these events are recorded in the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 13 to 18. These events are recorded in the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 13 to 18. Praise the Lord, somebody. It tells the story of Absalom and his rebellion against his father, King David. Am I preaching to someone today? Yes, sir. Okay. And this theme of rebellion, this theme of rebellion is also identified. This theme of rebellion is also identified in the actions of James Cole. And in the actions of Shaftesbury against Charles II. That's where you begin to see the parallel between the two stories. So the major device deployed, found in Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel is analogy. A classical analogy. Analogy between the Bible story and the events of the restoration period. Like James Scott, or like Absalom, James Scott was well admired as a young, handsome man. Just like Absalom, I wanted to know that Bible portion when you go when you read, right? Yes, sir. Those of you who are not true Christians <laughs> have to go and read. The, the Bible portion again, so that you can understand the story well. And, and you must also note that Charles really, really loved James Scott. Charles II loved his son, James Scott, illegitimate as he was. And the people try to exploit that law. You know, if you read the Bible story, there's no point in the story that David hated Absalom. There's no point. Okay? No matter what, no matter what Absalom did to him, he was always, he always expressed his love for him. Even in the final battle, he just said they should be gentle on his son Absalom. So the same, that's the same love that Charles II had for James Scott. And even when 
he dies by hanging on the tree, his hair um, got caught up um, in the fig tree and he hangs there and he's finally finished off um, by Job. David mourns for the son. And the same command, the same command that Absalom had over Israelites is the same command, charisma, charm, that James Scott had among the Protestants in England this time. So you could see the relationship. So in this story, in this story, Absalom, in this poem, Absalom, when you see Absalom, Absalom is equal to James Scott. Okay? Absalom represents James Scott in the poem. And Ahitophel represents Shaftesbury as Anthony Ashley Cooper. You would recall the council of Achitophel and how, and how it would have led to the destruction of David if it was not countered by the spy that David sent to Absalom's camp. Okay? It's the same thing that we see in the point when Shaftesbury's council fails with the, dis with the dissolution of Parliament by Charles II. So that's how um, this poem is to be understood. It is based on the biblical analogy. There are other characters too that the people of the time would have known better who they represent. Most of them Bible characters, but they represent figures, important political fig and religious figures in contemporary England. By contemporary England, I mean the Restoration period, the period that we are talking about. Okay? For instance, Miko, Miko, Miko mentioned in the poem represents Catherine of Baganza. You read the poem, you come across Miko, right? Miko represents Catherine of Baganza, the unproductive wife of Charles II. Miko was also childless, wife of David that did not bear a child. Right? So you, you can imagine that striking analogy on so many accounts. Okay? And in the poem, uh, uh, Dryden refers to Catherine of Braganza as a soil ungrateful to the tiller's All Right? It's a metaphor. A soil ungrateful to the tiller's Meaning that no matter what Charles did, right? No matter what Charles did, the soil was ungrateful could not produce any fruit. Whereas, historically, that's not really what happened, right? Charles actually neglected his um, duties on the wife. But you see that Dryden is trying to be soft on Charles, whom he supports with his art. Okay, so he calls her a soil ungrateful to the tiller skin. So in this poem, we also have the portrayal of Doik and Ock. Doik and Ock. Doik is spelled, uh, spelled D-O-E-G and Ock O-G. All right? They are portrayed in the poem as um, two weeks. They are the two weeks. Two week poets. Two week poets. Week. W-H-I-G. Two week poets. Elkana, Elkana Sato and Thomas Shadwell. 
So if you read the poem, you come across Doig and Ork. Uh, Doig means that you cannot settle. S E double T L E and Thomas Shadwell. Shadwell is spelled S H A D W E double L. We'll talk more about Thomas Shadwell when we want to talk about Mahflegno. All right? Thomas Shadwell. Shadwell is spelled S H A D W E double L. Shadwell. Thomas Shadwell. So Doug and Og portrayed in the poem, refer to two weak poets, the Kanasato and the Mashatwa. In the poem, David is who? Who is David? Charles II is David. He is the Israel's monarch in the poem. Okay? And Dryden playfully refers to Charles' promised cross life, which he, which he lived with his mistresses, leading to fathering of illegitimate sons. In the following lines, if you permit me to read, it says, Then is was monarch after heaven's own heart, his vigorous warmth did variously impart. To wives and slaves, and wide as his command, scatters, scattered his maker's image through the land. Right? Scattered his maker's image through the land. That's, he had many legitimate sons from different mistresses. That, that's what it means by scattering his maker's image through the land. You also come across Annabelle. Annabelle. You're likely to come across Annabelle. In the from Annabelle is spelled A double N A B E L. A double N A B E L. Annabelle. That refers to Anne Scott. That refers to Anne Scott. A N E, we have Scott. You will recall that um, the story, the story of, of Absalom, gets interesting when he killed his half brother Amnon. What does Amnon do? Yeah, who had raped Absalom's sister Tamar? So we have some very good Bible students in the class. Yeah. And all that only claim to be Christians. Right? Good. So go back and read the story so you can really enjoy the poem. So after doing that, he ran away. And it will take many years before he returned. Then we will not see the face of David. And he also manipulates his way back. Um, to the king before he now leads the heart away and then the, David has to run for his life then the epic battle is fought then he dies I think by an act of God because it's, it, through the story of Absalom we, we are supposed to say that we are supposed to get the idea that God even God himself hates rebellion alright and you remember you recall when the, when the first rebellion happened when did the first rebellion happen? Hmm? When did the first rebellion take place? In heaven. In heaven. What happened? What happened? When Lucifer, when Lucifer tried to raise himself um, against God, right, and he was cast down. Okay? That was the first rebellion that was put down. All right? And he came to be with men, probably teach them how to rebel against authority. And so, and so we have to um, keep putting down rebellions, right? In David's time and in King Charles II's time. Okay? Because we always have people who are 
who are after the throne to unsettle order. Because these guys in the restoration period really believed in an established order, which not, must not be disturbed. Because disturbing the established order is to bring chaos to the social scene of man. All right? Are you still with us? Yes. <laughs> and um, so probably um, I will just take a few lines and then we reserve the poem for next week. You can have a copy. Everybody can have a copy so that we read next week. Then you have um, a place called Sinon, S-I-N-O-N, in the poem. We are told that it is an indirect reference to London. Indirect reference to London. Sinon. S-I-N-O-N. And then we have the Jews. In the poem, the Jews are the English people. In the poem, the Jews are the English people. J-E-W-S. The Jews are the English people. They are referred to as a headstrong, moody, murmuring rage. They are referred to as a headstrong, moody, murmuring rage. The Jews are the English people, and in the poem, they are referred to as what? A headstrong, quote and unquote, a headstrong, moody, murmuring rage. Just like this Israelite, the English people. Are, are, are depicted are people who are very stubborn. All right? Remember what all the English people did? They said they told God that they wanted a king. They wanted to have a king, just like the other nations around, around them. All right? So they are stubborn, that's headstrong, moody. They are, not, they are never pleased, no matter what God does for them. They are still complaining, murmuring. Any little discomfort, they are complaining. All right? You've just eaten manna yesterday, and today, just a little discomfort you are complaining against. Moses, why did you bring us from Egypt? You want to kill, kill us all. All right? After all the wonders that God has done, they lack faith, they lack belief in their leaders, and all of that. Okay? So, they are depicted as a headstrong, moody, murmuring race. They are also referred to as God's pampered people. In the poem, the, the Jews, or the English people, are also referred to as God's pampered people. So looking at this poem, I'm really wondering how these analogies are so striking, you know, between the two ages, all right? God's pampered people debauched with ease. They don't, have, they don't, they don't want for anything. Everything is at that. This, the English people were very rich at this time very prosperous. Then, his bullshit is Oliver Cromwell in the poem. His bullshit, his bullshit is Oliver Cromwell, spelled I-S-H-B-O-S-H-E-T-H, is Oliver Cromwell. All right, let me have the point. So we'll read the point in the next class, but I want to make a statement um, on its meter by taking just the first um, few lines. In past times, a priestcraft did begin before polygamy was made a sin. When man and many multiplied its kind, a one to one was cursedly confined. All right? That's how the poem begins. That's how the poem begins. So you can, you can just note um, the lines. In pious times, a priestcraft 
did begin right before polygamy was made a sin when man on many multiplied his kind a one to one was cursedly confined so if you count the syllable of the first line one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two three four five six seven eight nine ten that's the first line has ten syllables second line before polygamy was medicine before polygamy was medicine the first line is in past time a priestcraft did begin before polygamy was medicine that's second line polygamy was medicine so you have second line one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so that is the meter of the point you have each line made up of ten syllables um, written in iambic pentameter that means the, the, the stress distribution the pattern of stress distribution is on stress stressed an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable and it occurs five times that gives you iambic pentameter so the poem is written in iambic pentameter in the next class we'll read the poem and discuss it before we move on to the next good morning Thank you.